Buenos Aires, ladies and gentlemen. Buenos Aires, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. I know my Spanish is poor, so you probably didn't understand that. <laughs> Welcome to session four, our last session uh, of, the, of day one here of Automotive Logistics Mexico 2018. Uh, this is always one of the, uh, the, the challenging sessions because it's obviously what's between you and, and a gala dinner uh, and, and, a, and a fun evening. But as usual, we, we make sure to, to put together a really interesting panel of speakers and presentations uh, that will certainly keep you engaged. So. We look forward to that. Just a couple, of, a couple of housekeeping notes, so to say, before we kick off. Uh, after this session, we're going to be, there'll be coach, there'll be buses and transportation taking us to the gala dinner, the Penske hosted gala dinner this evening. Uh, there's also, if you're going there yourself, you can, you can get directions uh, at, from the registration desk. It's at MIDE MAI, which is the Museum for Interactive Economics. And nothing says gala dinner like interactive economics. I think we've arranged a four-hour lecture for you. Uh, no, actually, it's, it's a fantastic venue. It's really beautiful. It's central, central uh, downtown. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, just another reminder, too, about the app that we've been using all day. Uh, we'd like you, hopefully, you've downloaded it by now. Uh, we're going to do a, in a couple of minutes. I'm going to just have a little bit of live polling, just as we did uh, in the first session. And I think some of our, our speakers will even use this this function as well. So, if you haven't downloaded the app or or um, or planning to, this would be a good time to do it. And within that app, you can you can choose the live poll, and also you can post, put questions. There we go. There's the instructions again. Uh, another time, if you hadn't if you hadn't uh, downloaded the app yet. Um, you know, you can use it as well, like I said, to ask questions to our panel uh, during the session. You can also uh, give feedback on each session. So if you go into the schedule, uh, you'll be able to choose by session and give us your feedback, rate, rate presentations, uh, give, us, give us an assessment. Tell us how, you, how you're finding the conference. This is our fourth year. We plan on very much being back again, and we want to make sure that we optimize this event to the best that we can based on, on what works for you. Okay, so and, and then that sort of brings us to our, our last, uh, our, like I said, our last session here. We're talking about digitalization and logistics in Mexico. I think this is a nice sort of capstone on, on a day where we've really addressed the gamut of, of challenges here, whether it was NAFTA, uncertainty, uh, investment in trade, the implications of, of changing technology, uh, as well as, of course, the, the sort of nitty gritty, the transport tr capacity issues, rail, border congestion, uh, lots of those topics which we were discussing uh, earlier in our, in our think tanks. For those of you who are there with us, uh, we had one think tank in particular talking about cross-border and just you know, dealing with all the different customs challenges. Actually, after that session, um, Jose Garcia Torres from the U.S.-Mexico Chamber of Commerce asked me to, to mention to you that, that he'd like to hear from you about those challenges that you have with customs, with, with different agencies, uh, because... The U.S.-Mexico Chamber of Commerce can actually help in areas like this, particularly with the, their connections to the customs. So um, we can, you can talk to me, and I can perhaps arrange for you to, to talk directly with Jose. We can set up a little meeting tomorrow. Um, we hope that we can address some of the issues and challenges as well as, as well as just talking about them. And of course, we also heard about premium manufacturing and the requirements, IT processes, systems that companies like Audi and BMW are, are bringing to Mexico and some of the challenges that are involved in doing that, um, but also the, the huge benefits that, that will come with that. And I think that sort of positions us well to, to delve into um, uh, what, our, what our panelists are gonna, going to uh, talk about this morning, or sorry, this afternoon. Uh, so let me introduce the panel. We're going to hear, have presentations from all four of them. Uh, Sven Darmani is the principal advisory, principal advisory services for EY, specifically on the, um, uh, in, in the automotive uh, supply chain area. Uh, Joe Collier, uh, sorry, I have that the wrong way around there. Obviously, uh, Sven is number second there. Joe is sitting right uh, to your right. Joe Collier is the senior vice president of global sales at Penske. Uh, also pleased to welcome Achim Glass, the head of Global Automotive Vertical, uh, Senior Vice President Kuhn, from Kuhn and Nagel. And last but certainly not least here, Keith Schall, Director of Technology Solutions for CHEP. So before we kick off with the presentation from, from Sven, um, we thought we'd take a little poll, again, using our, uh, the app that we used this morning. So again, if you, if you can open up your app for a moment and, and click on the tab 
for live poll. Uh, we'll put the question to you. It's just two short questions. We want to get a little sense of where you think Mexico uh, is positioned in, in, in the face of supply chain digitalization and industry transformation, uh, just to get a little comparison, perhaps. So if you were to say, you know, in terms of IT and digitalization of logistics compared to other regions where your company may operate, uh, your operations in Mexico are further advanced than those locations, quite similar uh, than those locations, behind or falling behind in those locations, or okay, you, don't, you, you can't really make the assessment, maybe you're only working here in Mexico. So if you can make a comparison between IT and digitalization for logistics, uh, let us know what you think uh, by, the, by the app now. So, unfortunately, uh, or perhaps fortunately for the panel, because it gives them some stuff to talk about, um, almost 60% of you think Mexico is actually behind um, other, other regions. 35% uh, put it at a similar level. Uh, very few see it as, as more advanced. So uh, that's part of the challenges we, we're facing here, is that um, although Mexico has a great manufacturing base, that perhaps with some of the changes and new technology coming, it might not be totally best positioned, but hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll look at ways to change that. And the second and last question, just in this short poll, is as the automotive industry builds more advanced vehicles, perhaps in the future, including, say, electric, connected, and autonomous features, the Mexican industry is well-placed to keep up with the changing industry, is at risk of falling behind as the industry changes, uh, will not see a major impact either way, or it's just too early to tell. So if we're talking about the way the automotive industry is changing, and those maybe the five myths that Brandon was talking about, again, how is, how is Mexico placed uh, to, to keep up with the changes? Please vote. Okay, so it's a bit more of a split, split field here. Um, slightly more of you than anything else think, think Mexico could fall behind here, uh, but, but almost a similar amount think that, uh, that, that it'll be able to keep up. And, and obviously it is quite early because we're not so much in the position perhaps in Mexico where this, this technology is, is the, major, the major focus. But, so that gives us a little bit of a sense that perhaps digitalization, supply chain digitalization and logistics in Mexico may have some, some work to do to, to keep up, but um, that's why we put this panel together. And on that basis, I'd like to invite Sven, because I think Sven's kicking us off uh, to uh, start, or Joe, sorry, I, I, yeah, it's Sven, isn't it? So Sven from EY. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Christopher. <clears throat> uh, thank you for having me here. It's uh, exciting to be here. Um, I'm Sven Darmani. I'm a, I lead the global supply chain and operations team for Ernst Young. Uh, for those who don't know EY, we have about 230,000 people worldwide. 70,000 of those roughly focus on consulting and around the world, we have about 10,000 people dedicated to automotive sector. So it's a pretty important sector for us. So we'll talk a little bit about um, the, the digitization uh, in the industry. So every year, um, we do a <clears throat> annual study. And we look at, um, basically, we talk to 150 top executives in the industry. These are CEOs, COOs, um, CFOs, primarily that level. Um, and we try to understand from them what are their main concerns as they look forward. So this was the study findings from this year, uh, and one of the key area is uh, digitalization across the value chain. We see some others, which is you know they're, they're sources of unpredictability. You know who owns the data, uh, lack uh, lack of resources and talent in the industry, uh, aging workforce, etc. But digitalization across supply chain is, is a key hot topic, and every CEO and every CEO is thinking about that. So it, it has a lot of different elements, uh, but I think the most important one, uh, you know, when you think about digital transformation, there is a, a, a lot of computing power available now. There is, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, or deep learning uh, that we are applying. There is uh, robotic process automation. Uh, there is physical automation as well which is getting better and better. And then you, know, you have all this data that you can put in a data lake and uh, do a lot of predictive and prescriptive analytics on it. So predictive analytics, uh, prescriptive analytics is actually feeding 
uh, a lot of decision making and, and how you can run the business more efficiently. So these are some of the key um, things we've, we've heard from the leaders in the, in the automotive industry through our annual survey. So you know, kind of ties back to why are we here today? We are here because this is a hot topic and a hot issue in the industry. So when, I, when we specifically look at uh, Mexico, um, you know, they're, they're, we find uh, four key factors that are challenging Mexico currently. One, you know, there's unpredictability in the environment. Uh, you know, we've talked about NAFTA, we've talked about Miquiladora being under pressure, but, you know, more importantly, things that we can control, um, you know, there is issues around availability of labor, um, skilled labor. Uh, you know, we hear from our clients all the time that there is a very high turnover rate, as high as 30% in plants. Um, so imagine if you're replacing one-third to two-third, you know, one-third to half of your resources in the plant, how do you maintain that quality, right? So th that's one of the key issue. Infrastructure, you know, in, there is so much exciting development happening in Mexico that the infrastructure is not able to keep, uh, keep pace, and uh, so it's getting pushed to the limit. Uh, rail, you know, we heard a little bit about uh, from Peter uh, this morning as well as Dr. Koch around uh, the ports and the rail. So, you know, those are some of the issues that are getting, uh, creating challenges for Mexico. Um, the other one, interesting one is, you know, when we look at, when we do an analysis of the industry in Mexico, you know, there's a, there's a robust base of tier one suppliers. But what we found is if you go one level down to tier two or tier three, that's uh, not as robust. It's, it's fairly fragmented. Uh, that's where we see a lot of challenges. And you know, uh, our last study found that about 76% of the um, process imports were actually coming from uh, they were imports. So um, that's a big opportunity for, for Mexico is to take that 76% and really build it up. Because the closer you can have your tier twos and tier threes, um, you know, the more integrated your supply chain can be, more responsive it can be. You know, we heard earlier, you can really change an order, you know, six days before production, which means uh, if I decide to change my option or my color for the seat uh, in the car, you know, six days before, which the supplier for the leather seat has to be able to find gray leather instead of beige leather, right? Or it has to be a heated and cooled seat instead of a plain seat. Um, and so, you know, you, you, how do you achieve that? Um, it's through integration, through use of you know, digital technologies and other capabilities as well. But really, you know, a lot of areas where um, you know, Mexico can, can uh, make more progress with tier two and tier three uh, supplies, we estimate about $40 billion worth of opportunity uh, for, for tier two and tier three manufacturing. So that's gonna, that's, that, that'll help, but the question becomes when you have all these sources of uh, unpredictability and variability, how do you really um, leapfrog? And, and that's where digital comes in. So <clears throat> I'm not going to go through the details of this. I think we actually heard a little bit about track and trace this morning. And we work with, uh, we are actually collaborating with Penske on some of the digital track and trace uh, initiatives, uh, driving innovation of how do you get early demand sensing or early sensing that there is an issue in your supply chain, how do you respond to it? But if you look at, you know, we'll say three key areas. One, track and trace. Uh, how do I understand what's happening in my supply chain, both on inbound and outbound side, and how do I respond to it effectively? Secondly, my manufacturing, which is not just my own manufacturing, but the suppliers who are feeding just in time or just in sequence or bulk parts. And then finally, what is the risk to my supply chain and my value chain? There could be a physical disruption, uh, there could be theft, you know, there are other, other things that are happening as well. Um, so when we look at these, you know, there, there is a good application of digital capabilities, of digital supply chain um, that can help <clears throat> really uh, address so, and solve some of the problems. And this is where the value really comes in um, for companies is to, you know, apply some of these leading technologies, you know, using IoT, using sp smart sensors, uh, using, uh, you know, machine learning, deep learning, using artificial intelligence, robotic process automation, and integrating in into, you know, one value chain. So, you know, what's the, you know, what's the end state? If I were, if I were to say, what's nirvana 
nirvana in our mind is an autonomous value chain which senses a change either from demand side that the customer has changed the order and how do I react to it rather than being a batch process, you know, going through overnight cycles and taking five days where the supplier actually finds out that there was a change. So that's one side responding to it or, um, you know, a change on the supply side where a highway sh shut down or there was a fire in a factory and that particular, you know, chemical compound is no longer available so I won't be able to make brake lines for three days. So that's the, that's the nirvana is the autonomous value chain uh, which can, can sense and respond very, very quickly. Um, and that's where, you know, Mexico has a great advantage too when you look at NAFTA. Uh, there's just a, such a short uh, transit and lead time compared to you know, offshore resources uh, where it can, it can create a lot of value uh, and drive a lot of growth. So I'm not gonna talk to all of these, <clears throat> but let me just take a couple of examples and tell you how digital really comes to life in a plant or in automotive manufacturing. So typically, many plants think of energy and utilities as an overhead. What if you were to you know, completely change the paradigm and say, I am going to look at my bill of material and I'm gonna include my utility, my compressed air, my steam, you know, gas, electricity as a part of that. So if I make a base vehicle, uh, I use X units of energy and gas and air. If I make a premium vehicle with a turbo motor and you know, all the bells and whistles, I use X plus 20%, right? So, and, and what you have to do is you have to utilize smart sensors, you have to segment your production, and you have to measure the throughput and also the energy consumption in, in, in that area. So if you were to do that, do an assessment, do an evaluation, and then come up with your baseline of saying, here is my bill of material, which includes my power, my water, you know, and, and compressed air, now you can actually be really smart and say, if I'm going to flex and I'm going to increase my capacity by 20%, what do I need? I need 20% more power. Guess what else I can do with that? I can go back to the power authority and say, uh, how, how about I'll help you level load your, your ut utilization of energy? Uh, we use, uh, let's take an example of painting. I use a lot of energy in painting, and I'm right now doing it in, in my peak hours. What if I were to shift that to non-peak hours between 5 p.m. and 9 p.m. and help you level load when the load isn't so high on the grid? You know, you can actually get a discount from utility companies. These are not hypothetical scenarios. These are real cases that we've implemented where we've helped companies get a discount from the power generation uh, authorities because they've helped them level load. So, so that's an example of digital. How does digital help um, drive efficiency and cost savings? Let me take another example around labor constraint and, and uh, predictive maintenance or augmented reality. Um, you know, there's, a, there's predict, uh, preventive maintenance that occurs. You know, the, toolings have, uh, the tooling has to be inspected and repaired, but it doesn't happen very often. So if you're having a lot of turnover in the workforce, then the, the new person doesn't maybe have enough experience of how to disassemble and reassemble the tool effectively. That's where augmented reality can come in. So imagine having you know, virtual reality glasses, which are actually giving you a step-by-step -step instruction of how to pull that tool apart without damaging it with minimum effort, what to watch for, where the catches are, and then being able to reassemble it back uh, very efficiently. And since you only do it once every six, seven months, maybe once eight months, you don't have to do it very often. So the training, even if you give them the training, it becomes pretty stale. So using tools like augmented reality can help drive productivity and quality as well. So you know, these are real life examples. This is actually happening in um, aviation industry right now. They are using um, you know, virtual reality to help with manufacturing and, and maintenance. <clears throat> the, the other element of how you can use uh, data analytics is uh, doing smart maintenance, right? So let's say if I were to replace uh, a seal on a machine which has high temperature in oil uh, every 600 hours. However, um, we've averaged it out and it's really, you know, uh, six months, every six months. But maybe that machine didn't get used. Or maybe in a different plant, 
the ambient temperature was five degrees more than the plant one. So this O-ring actually needs to get replaced uh, in four months, not six months, to prevent a failure. So you can use advanced analytics and predictive uh, analytics to figure out how to drive up productivity. So, so these are all real life examples of how digital can, can get used in driving productivity and driving improvement through the supply chain. Um, you know, so when we look at it, um, you know, it can help us with uh, sources of un unpredictability. It can help us in infrastructure. We talk about track and trace. I think uh, Joe is gonna talk a little bit perhaps about that as well, but you can have visibility to inbound and outbound. If you're having an issue with your inbound, you can actually respond to that and say, maybe I pull forward my, predictive main, you know, my, my preventive maintenance so I can do a shutdown now rather than actually having the plant get shut down forcibly. <clears throat> you can do energy management to balance out your needs. Um, you can address some of the labor constraints through supplemental training, augmented reality. Uh, you can also look at supply chain risk. So I talked about le uh, lower tier manufacturing, tier two, tier three. When we look at supply chain disruption, it is primarily happening due to issues in tier two and tier three, not tier one. That's our observation. You can use advanced analytics, you can use data sources from uh, companies like Bloomberg, Dun Bradstreet, uh, and create an integrated dashboard which uh, gives you a predictive view of, here is a company which is having financial distress. If there are your tier two or tier three suppliers, you may have an issue, you may wanna look into having enough uh, supply from them, or put your team on the ground in advance of uh, them going through a financial distress situation. So um, those are the ways you can use, um, you know, supplier, uh, supplier risk, uh, uh, you know, dashboards and predictive analytics. It's almost like a little bit of minority report. You know, your, your uh, analytics become so advanced that it predicts where you're going to have a problem, so you can actually go and tackle it before it happens. So that's sort of, you know, the autonomous... Uh, value chain autonomous supply chain that that we are thinking about uh, and, and in, you know we haven't honestly we haven't seen one company do it all we are seeing clients take pieces of it where they're comfortable and then go chase it down and and, and really here the idea is fail fast pilot something see if it works in your environment learn and adapt make it successful if it doesn't work toss the idea move on to the next idea because not everything will work everywhere. Uh, so, so it's pretty exciting, um, you know, just kind of uh, looking at, you know, what do we see happening, you know, where, where, uh, where can people look next? You know, you've got to start asking the questions. And, and this is coming, you know, supply chain 4.0 is here. Um, so it's, you know, it's IoT, it's uh, analytics, it's smart sensors, it's data. Data is the underlying, you know, foundation for all of this. But um, you know, it's it's uh, it's really changing the way you know companies are working and driving productivity through uh, their their supply chain. So, um, based on our analysis, we see that Industry 4.0 is going to drive you know a 25 percent or even better improvement in the value chain, in the supply chain, and that's what we believe the leading companies are going to to realize. Uh, but the lagging companies are going to realize only 5 to 10% improvement through Industry 4.0, uh, your digital supply chain. So, so that's a pretty big competitive gap. Uh, and I think that's where the opportunity is to, to really leapfrog your competition and uh, figure out how to apply you know, digital supply chain um, uh, capabilities uh, in your business. So, so that's, uh, you know, that's a little bit of our perspective of how we see digital supply chain and and we, we really believe there's a plan, you know tremendous opportunity in Mexico to apply these digital capabilities and drive productivity and quality improvement so that's what I had to cover thank you Thanks. thank you Sven very interesting perspective there and, and as, you, as you noted lots of potential I think those numbers the savings would be very attractive to any to anybody running plants or supply chains in this room. Uh, obviously, we heard this morning about obviously business cases which may shift when you, you move to certain automation, but a lot of the sort of analytics and data work that Sven was pointing to, I don't know that that, that doesn't need to wait for, for labor costs to skyrocket before they can be implemented. So this isn't the stuff of tomorrow, this is actually the stuff of today. Um, so a great start for us there, and that leads uh, nicely to, to Joe Collier from Penske. 
uh, to tell us the perspective from a logistics service provider. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, everybody. Um, before I kick things off, I, I just want to uh, acknowledge, um, you know, Automotive Logistics uh, Group and Louis and, and his team, and you know, thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity. Um, when Louis originally called me and asked me if I would, you know, share the stage and provide some thoughts, I was extremely honored. But then I saw the time slot that I got, and then I accepted. But I figured out what was behind Louis' strategy. Since Penske is hosting the gala dinner tonight, I am certain that the purpose of me speaking at this hour is to ensure that we're not late for the gala tonight. So, um, I really enjoy talking about this topic, and I just really want to pick up a little bit on uh, what Sven said and shared. Um, a long day, a lot of information uh, to process, a lot of great information that we can take home with us. Um, but really, my objective in the time that I have is to really leave everybody with a thought for consideration. Not only what Penske may be able to do for you, but really what our overall industry can do as a 3PL provider. How can we assist you in moving your supply chains forward? As I said, technology, I really enjoy talking about it. I get into some very long debates and discussions with colleagues and friends, and I seem to find myself all the time landing in one spot. And I don't know why, but every time I get into technology conversations, I land on the cell phone. Not sure how many people in the room remember this, when this was introduced to the market. Okay, I'm aging myself. But this was in uh, 1980, uh, 1986, and this was really the first commercial acceptance of the cell phone. And a uh, little story behind that is I had a really good friend of mine pick me up one day and I get in his car, and he actually had the cell phone sitting down on his floorboard. And I looked at it with enormous intrigue and said, oh my goodness, there's a phone in your car. And he said, yeah, try it, it's great, it's phenomenal, you can communicate and blah, blah, and make calls from the road, <clears throat> from the road, et cetera. So I grabbed it and immediately recognized that, oh my goodness, the keys light up, this thing can remember 30 pre-programmed phone numbers, and oh, by the way, I can have three hour talk time on this thing. I thought it was pretty amazing. So he says to me, he says, make a phone call. So I thought about who am I gonna call? So naturally, the one person I knew that would answer the phone was my mother. So I called her and as expected, she answered the phone and I said, hey mom. And she said, hey, is everything okay? I don't typically call her. And she said, yeah, everything's fine. But guess where I'm calling from? I'm calling from my friend's car. He said, oh, that's wonderful. Is everything okay? I said, yes, and she said, well, okay, I gotta let you go, I'm busy, boom, that was the end of that. Um, she didn't have that same appreciation for the advancement as, of technology as I did. But I fast forward to today, and you think about the power behind the mobile phone that we have today. So I'm sure if I ask that question, everybody in this room probably has the mobile phone. And if you think about the advancement of technology, uh, Apple introduced the first uh, iPhone in 2006. So if you really think about the adoption rate of the cell phone from 2006, just a little over 10 years, it's quite incredible. And I get into these debates around, was this really innovative? Is the cell phone innovative? And I'll ask somebody, what is the most innovative product you've come across in the last 10 years? And they all tell me it was a cell phone. Well, I disagree because I, I really believe that it was the App Store that really transformed the way we do business, the way we manage our personal lives, and even today, it manages our homes. Today, there's approximately six and a half billion subscriptions to cell phone coverage today in a world population of a little over uh, seven billion. Um, and it's pretty incredible when you think of the things that you can do and how it does transform our business. Each of us interact with our phone. We unlock our phones probably six to seven times per hour. We probably have approximately 70 web interactions throughout the course of the day. Um, and there's a lot of focus and there's a lot of data that we're collecting in every one of those interactions. So if you think about the trail that you're leaving, just in your personal lives, but the amount of data that we're collecting, 
And when you transform that over, transfer that over into our business and how we're relying on our cell phone to operate our business, the amount of data that we're collecting on any given day. I know when I look at the data, when we extract that data, this is what I see. I see a whole bunch of noise. I really can't figure out what it is, what it's supposed to tell me, what we're gonna do with it. So it really all boils down to really having a strategy around what to do with the data. And just to pick up on some of your comments and you think about predictive analytics and uh, artificial, it's really all about the data that we're collecting and what we do with it. So it's essential that we have a strategy around the data. But then as a 3PL provider, I'm collecting data from a whole host of sources, but then I'm also factoring in what's happening in the automotive industry. What are all the technologies and innovative thoughts and ideas and um, new practices that are taking place? Anywhere from blockchain, augmented reality, autonomous driving, et cetera, et cetera, the connected car. Just more and more things to consider as a 3PL provider. How can we continue to drive value to you? And how can we make sense of this data that drives efficiencies and effectiveness within your supply chain? We partner with e and on, on a, a global 3PL or a global logistics study, but we also partner with Penn State and some others on the 3PL industry, the state of the logistics business. If anybody wants a copy of this, you can go to our booth and we can have a, a digital copy sent to you. But for a 3PL, it, this was some really good information because we really started asking that question. So I have all this data. It's coming from so many sources, what can I do with it? So we went to the market and if you look at the two sides, off to the left, the first question really was around, what is in use today in your business? What are you, what's important to you? How is it being used? So we really got a good understanding of what the market really thought of different technologies and, and capabilities out there. Off to the right, we asked the question, the supply chains of tomorrow, what's gonna be most important to you? And what should shippers and 3PLs really be focusing on to drive the most value? So if you look at the very first stop off to the right, it was data analytics. Big data analytics, again, so many sources of data. But one of the uh, telling things within this chart to me was off to the left when I look at big data analytics, it appeared at that time frame that it was more important to a 3PL than it may have been to the shipper. Supply chains of tomorrow, it's going to be that much important, and as you can see there in the charts, the big data analytics is equally important to the 3PL industry as well as the shipper. And what this tells me is it really gives us, as a 3PL provider, a real opportunity to work with each of the shippers, the auto manufacturers. How can we make sense of the data? What is the challenge that we're trying to answer and solve? And how can we use data to solve that problem? Penske, what we did over the last several years is we recognized that we had a number of different systems that were essentially standalone. So we put them all under one roof, suite per se, like Microsoft with Excel and PowerPoint and Word and how they're all integrated, and ensure that our own technologies talk to each other. Didn't matter if it's our assets, where we have a connected fleet and our trucks are able to communicate to us as to what's happening out there. May it be in our warehouses and our WM systems and how can we ensure that all our systems are talking to each other. So again, so we can collect all of that data and all of that information and really make it valuable, turn it into knowledge. And then lastly, we have this strategy, we have this data. I think most 3PLs and many in the room, we, I think we all do a fantastic job around descriptive analytics. Taking what is happening in our world today and having a data picture drawn for us. There's many that have the capability around the prescriptive, where we can take that data and really understand what is happening in our, in our worlds that are in correct, direct conflict with what should be happening. What are those exceptions? Looking forward, it's really about the predictive analytics. How can we take this data, and if you think about you know, the Mexico supply chain, the complexities with border crossings and the mul multiple handoffs, how can we take that information and really make it valuable to you as the shipper to determine what those challenges are upstream. What are those disruptors gonna be? 
and how can we predict exactly what may happen before it happened and use that data to come to those conclusions. I'll go back to the, uh, the question this morning, the li or the live poll that we just took, and I actually believe that Mexico is in a great position to move technology forward. There are challenges, but there's so many good things that are happening in the Mexican supply chain and in the automotive industry. And again, in closing and in summary, I would just hope that a thought as you leave is how can you, the shipper, work closer with your 3PLs to really get to and move forward your supply chain efficiencies and effectiveness by using data. So thank you and hope to see everybody this evening at our gala dinner. And I think, Louis, objective met, right? You wanted to ensure, so fantastic. Thank you, Joe. Thanks a lot. Yeah, we have a timer there, and, and if he goes below, goes over the time, there's a trap door that drops and we take you out anyhow. So we would have got there either way, Joe. But thank you for that. I think it was a, a great presentation on, 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 on the kind of tools that uh, we're talking about here with digitalization, the way that Penske is looking at them, the way the 3PLs and shippers, as that survey showed, is looking and what we can talk about with predictive, uh, with different kinds of data analytics. So uh, a lot of interesting food for thought there. Now I'd like to invite Achim Glass from Kunenagel. Good evening, esteemed audience. And I also would like to express a warm welcome to our customers, colleagues, and friends for watching us on the live stream today. My name is Achim Glass, and in the capacity of being the head of the global automotive vertical, my core responsibility lies in the execution of our global growth strategy. And actually, innovation plays a very important part in our strategy. Consequently, uh, I've prepared a slide deck for you today, and I would like to achieve three objectives. First and foremost, uh, I would like ex to explain why we at Kunenage believe that data is one of the most important assets in the logistics industry today. I mean, we heard similar opinions from my fellow fellow speakers here. And I also would like to share with you how we actually use data to improve the value chain performance of one of our customers. In the second part of my presentation, I would then like to give an insight in how we in Kuhnemagel actually create a climate that allows innovation, how we foster innovation in our organization, and I would like to give you two humble uh, examples about our technological innovation on the shop floor in our warehouses. And eventually, um, my overall objective is to make you all curious to explore how the examples which we are sharing with you today that can become materialized here in the Mexican market. And having said so, I, I brought a fine team of colleagues with me to Mexico City. I have a colleague joining from China, colleagues flew over from Europe, also colleagues from the United States, and of course my Mexican colleagues are over here. We are all passionate innovators, and we saw from the poll which we conducted a couple of minutes ago that we believe, that majority of you believes, that Mexico is actually falling behind with regards to exploiting digitalization. Please come to us, visit us at the booth, because we would like to help you to show how we can bring um, innovation at work also here in Mexico. The digital economy is transforming the logistics industry. And we have witnessed that many, many industries, banking and retail and finance, have also um, experienced this, this disruptor of technology. Let me give the example of tap, ride, pay with Uber. Uber is rivaling the, the traditional taxi business. And eventually, we also see that these digitalizational trends are impacting all of us consumers and everybody along the supply chain. Actually, though, we also experienced that we see a slower transformation in digitalization in the logistics industry. Why? The reason lies, in our opinion, because of the complexity. It is very, very complex to manage international supply chains, and therefore there has been a lack in aggressiveness in developing and exploiting these trends. However, we are also witnessing aggressive investments into startups and technology providers. And on the bottom right slide, you see a couple of names of those known startup companies which will help to improve supply chain performance and uh, user experience. The core statement on this slide, so you can see on the bottom left, the whole idea of the value chain itself is being undermined by this new model of power which generates new revenue streams, 
by the monetization of data and is most likely asset light. So let's have a closer look at data because, as I said previously, we believe that data is the most important asset or one of the most important assets in logistics. So we're going to zoom into data now and we disregard the entire digitalization element. We zoom into digitalization, in, in, into data. So data will drive service quality. What does that mean? Actually, what we expect is that customers are going to call us because certain things happen. And in the future, we know that customers are going to call us, that something has happened. And that means we, in fact, know that the customers experience a problem in supply chain because we are analyzing data. And the example I can give you is the vessel ATA is predicting that the, that the container ship will arrive in five days. But actually, we know by using predictive analytics that the vessel ATA is going to be delayed even further. So proactively, we can contact our customers and we can plan for corrective action. Data will also attract new customers. By using predictive analytics, we will have the possibility to identify user trends and user behavior and buying patterns. And I want to give you an example. We know the customers which will call in Google for logistics services in the next couple of days. Why are we doing that? Because we know that, for example, there is an earthquake going to happen. So there is a high demand on, on blankets, on tents, and of bottled water. And if we know that a couple of days in advance, before the prices to fly emergency birds, planes uh, to, to, to the country in need, uh, we can actually then capitalize on that. We can achieve better buying rates for our customers because if everybody calls and is asking for Jumbo 747s, for, uh, for the aid and relief organizations, uh, the prices are going to go up. But by having data available sooner, we can plan better and we can eventually also reduce supply chain costs. And eventually, data will also help us to create new products and how actually we have done that in Kunamagel, I would like to share with you on my last slide on data before we then move on into innovation at Kunamagel. Some of you will know that Kunamagel launched the GKNI, the Global Kunamagel Indicator, two years ago, where we use big data and predictive analytics to provide up-to-date data and data signals to financial institutions of this world so that they can give recommendations on hold, buy, or sell. Um, what we are doing now is we are applying the same technology in logistics. And actually, the example I would like to share with you today is of one of our American cruise ship providers, where on average, on a 14-day cruise, on a 3,000-passenger ship with approximately 1,000, 1,200 crew, 172,000 meals are going to be served. And the challenge our customer has is that he doesn't have enough space to store for the food. We are talking about 4,000 eggs per day. We are talking about 32,000 shrimps per week. They simply don't have the capacity to store that and to cool that material. So we are using predictive analytics in order to help to support the supply chain of our customer. So what are we doing? We, are, we know the vessel location by using GPS data, and we, can use, we are using geofencing technology to forecast, because we know the speed of the vessel, what is the estimated arrival time of the vessel in the port? Because we also know whether there are port strikes, whether there's port congestion, and we know the weather forecast. In addition to that, we are also using our Kunamagi priority data, where we are checking with the suppliers to the cruise line the, availab the availability of products, which products are actually available, and which products can we have at the right point of time at the port. And last but not least, we are using the data from our customer with regards to demographics, of passengers on the, on the ship. How many children are on board? Are there more male than female? What have people actually eaten, eaten over the past couple of days in order to predict what are they going to eat over the next couple of days? And what is the benefit of that? The benefit is A, when you supply cruise vessel provisioning, we have to deliver to all cruise ports in the world in three temperature zones. Ambient, we deliver chilled products, and we deliver also frozen material. And actually, in particular in, in the European ports where we have the tides, the water level goes up and down a couple of times during the day. That means when the container vessel is in the port, at a certain point of time, the vessel will rise or the vessel will go down further. That gives our opportunity to deliver cargo on board. Uh, it will limit the opportunity for us to a couple of hours to actually deliver container products on board of that vessel. So the on-time delivery is very, very similar 
the accuracy required to us in the automotive industry we are, where we are delivering just in time or just in sequence. So our tools are helping our customers and they're using it today in order to ensure that we have the right product available and uh, that they can have a high customer satisfaction because people will actually have available what they would like to order and eat on board. And at the same time, it, it will help to avoid waste because there's still a lot of waste being produced, which means food, which is not being used, which is eventually we're going to throw away. So this is a real life example how we are deploying data in order to improve supply chain performance and customer satisfaction. Let's now move on to, to innovation. And in fact, I don't like innovation. I love innovation because innovation is part of our DNA. And I would like to share with you how in Kuhnemagel we are using a dual strategy to foster innovation. We learned earlier that in the logistics industry, innovation is moving at a slower pace. And the slower pace uh, we see is being generated by our friends in the business unit, so by our sea freight, or freight, air freight, overland, or contract logistics operations. Innovation happens on the shop floor. So we provide uh, tools for improvement to our employees to, to achieve process optimization and cost optimization. But actually, that is not fast enough. So, so what we are doing is we are permanently scouting for ideas. Where are the new trends in the industry which we can deploy very, very early in order to become a more agile and a leaner organization? And you see on the bottom left um, a press clip from two weeks ago where Kühne Nagel teamed up with an um, Asian investor in order to form a joint venture to eventually support the speed and development of startup in logistics. Together with our partner, we will have the possibility to go into rapid prototyping, and we allow for failure. That means while our colleagues in the business unit are still doing the gradual, continuous improvement innovation within our organization, we're using our speedboats, our partner, our joint venture in Asia, in order to speed up development with regards to innovation. You also see that uh, in March, our organization is teaming up with the Kühne Logistics University in Hamburg and together with IBM, one of our preferred technology providers, in order to talk about in the Internet of Things and chatbots. And chatbots is something what all of you know. On your iPhone, you have Siri. Siri is a chatbot. It's not a human being. It's artificial intelligence talking back to you. Or we have Alexa, Alexa in our house. Alexa, what time is it? And Alexa is going to respond back to us. You guys are going to the internet and you're booking a flight on the airline and you're struggling, you're not booking fast enough, so the window pops up. This is actually a chatbot which is asking you, how can I help you? And they can predict the questions you're going to have and they're going to feed those questions back to you. So eventually staying with Amazon here for a second, Amazon is having 200,000 blue collar workers in their warehouses. And they're having more than one million cobots in their warehouses. I think that is a pretty, pretty impressive number, which takes me actually to the next slide um, before I will sum up with my two final slides for the day. I would like to share with you how cobots and autonomous material handling equipments are being used in our warehouses and eventually um, how are we deploying wearables in our aftermarket warehouses. So cobots um, are being deployed together with autonomous handling with equipment, which you can see in the middle of the slide, the, the small self-driving vehicle which is pulling a cage. Um, we have a pharmaceutical customer, and this pharmaceutical customer is requiring us to label two million diabetic products per year, which means on a seven-day working week on our one-shift operations, we are talking about labeling 1,250 products per hour. And in the past, this was done manual. And the objective of our project with our customer was obviously to, to increase productivity and also to, to reduce manpower, but not necessarily to reduce manpower costs, but also to reduce the availability of manpower, because that is the bottleneck. Also in our aftermarket warehouses, for example, here in Mexico, you know when the orders are coming in from the dealers, we are picking and packing and picking and packing, and simply for space reasons, you can only have such a high number of people available to pick at the same time. And then what happens afterwards, when the peak is over, you, you don't know what to do with the people, so you need to operate extremely lean. So by the deployment 
of, of cobots and the autonomous handling equipment, uh, we have achieved our target of, of packaging more than 60,000 diabetic products per day. And while they are being packed, we increased a much higher user acceptance. Uh, there's no more autonomy uh, for, for our people in the warehouse. And eventually, uh, we also found that this solution is very scalable to apply it in other warehouses. You may have realized that on the top right, uh, what I indicated over there is the maturity level of that particular solution within our organization. So yes, we are using cobots and, and the handling equipment in first applications. We have multiple pilots running right now, but it's not yet a solution where we say, this is standard, it's going to go to the mass market. You know us, we're 127 years in the marketplace. We are very careful before we go into mass production, mass market. So it is still a pilot stage, and we can also execute these projects together with you here in Mexico. On the bottom of the slides, you also see a small indication about costs, what actually is the cost to deploy the solution. And we believe that the financial benefits by far outweigh the investments in that solution. Which takes me actually to my last slide, uh, the application of pick by pro gloves, pick by watches, by wristbands, or pick by vision. So actually what we have experienced is uh, a, a different user acceptance uh, from our workers. You know, we are still at a conceptual stage over here by the application, for example, of Google Glasses. You have a Google Glass, and the Google Glass tells you exactly what to pick. And many of our colleagues told us, we don't like it for hygienic reasons and also for the quality of the glasses, not the quality of the software, but that isn't good. So people don't actually like it. But what people like is the pro glove. You have the glove, and you see that over there in the large picture. And the glass is actually connected with RFID. It is scanning the light location, and you pick into the right location. And at the same time, you're scanning the product. So it is avoiding that you need to have a barcode in your hand in order to, yeah, to scan the material, which will result eventually in the multiple benefits which you can see over here on the slide. And uh, this is also a solution which is not very expensive to implement. And I believe there's a room for improvement also here in the Mexican market across all industries, not just for automotive, to take more advantage of these technologies which are available today. That actually took me to the end of my presentation. I would like to thank you for your uh, participation and for your patience and listening to me. And I'm handing back to Christopher Lupik. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Achim, for our articulate and, and comprehensive view there of a number of areas of innovation and technology, again, touching on the data side, uh, also looking at what, what we're seeing in warehousing. Appreciate the, the, uh, the cruise ship supply. Uh, I think when we planned with Joe our provision for this evening, uh, luckily we've planned, I think, about 180,000 bottles of beer, so we should be all right uh, based you know, on our own predictive analytics. So I think we'll we're all learning from these processes as well. But thanks again for a great presentation. We'll have some time for Q&A as well at the end. Uh, but our last presentation before we move on to that Q&A, proud to, happy to give the podium over to Keith Shaw from CHEP. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I'd like to start out by thanking everybody for sticking around to the end here. Um, <laughs> it's been a great day of discussion and sessions and hopefully everybody's starting to get a little hungry and head off to that gala dinner sponsored by Penske. Joe, thank you for that in advance. Um, so I want to close here with some kind of topics regarding asset tracking systems. A little bit more specifics for the actual system itself. Um, if we go on to the next slide here, actually I can do that, sorry. Um, the topics I'm going to touch on uh, center around what the current state is in the industry for track and trace and what are some of the market trends that we're seeing every day. We'll talk about the different technology options that are out there, some that are existing and some that are emerging more and more. The defining the pain points and the feasibility for implementing track and trace systems within your supply chains. And then lastly, we'll talk about some best practices for implementing track and trace systems and focusing on continuous improvement. So one of the things here, I want to throw up a, a question, um, as we've heard all the panelists talk about track and trace and the importance, but I thought it'd be a good time to pull the audience and ask the question of, if we can get that. Oh, oh. oh okay. Just throw that poll question. Uh, 
Oh, we'll skip it. <laughs> we'll move on, so improvise. Um, oh, there we go. So my question today is, what are some of the greatest obstacles that your organization see when trying to implement a track and trace system or asset management solution? If you guys could just take out your phones really quick and we'll give you a few seconds to vote. Um, we're not gonna review the results now, but at the end of this presentation, we'll check back and see what the number one answers were. Great, thank you. Oh. <laughs> okay. There we go. Um, I am on a title slide, so bear with me. So technical difficulties, right? IT never works perfectly, so I apologize. Um, I don't know, if, are we able to get the slides back up? There we go. So we are at the very end there, let's back up. Okay, so as we talked about the topics, the first thing I wanna talk about is what do I mean by individual track and trace? I would guess that most of you have some sort of track and trace system in its aggregate format, right? A debit credit system, some type of netting in and out of quantities, um, really can be done in an ERP system or as basic as a spreadsheet. So when I say individual track and trace, I'm talking about unique ID or individualized serial ID of reusable assets. And for the sake of this presentation, when I reference RTIs, let's talk about um, plastic pallets or wooden pallets. We're talking about held FLCs or bulk containers um, or even handheld totes, right? Not just transport items, but also the goods that go inside those transport items. So over the years, Track and trace is kind of perceived as a luxury, right? If I have the resources, if I have the time and the money, maybe I'll look to implement some type of track system. I think now what we're seeing as people are starting to realize that it's more a requirement than a luxury, right? And probably the number one driver for that is loss prevention. These assets are getting lost, okay? And that can find these in the set of where were they last and build back accountability? Are they within my possession in my service center or my warehouse? Are they with my customer? Are they with my suppliers? Asset availability is basically the right asset in the right place at the right time, right? A good track and trace system should give you this and solve for that. That's because it's going out. Um, trading partner relationships, right? A lot of our customers and a lot of our suppliers are mandating now that in order for them to ship goods or services into our four walls, we have to have tracking systems in place, sometimes our own or sometimes theirs. So again, they're dictating this, that it's mandatory in order to do business with them. Asset maintenance history, right? These assets should tell a, a story about the life of it. When was it purchased? When was it implemented? How many times has it been damaged or repaired? What's the dwell time, right? Where's the cycle time? How long has it been there? Regulating and governing bodies. There are standardizations now that are saying, hey, um, for example, in the United States, we have something called Sarbanes-Oxley. If you're going to put these assets on your balance sheet and say, um, I'm amortizing these over the life, you better know where they are, right? You can't just say they're out there somewhere because technically you could be out of compliance as it relates to an accounting standard. Um, when you ship goods overseas, a lot of those customs, paperwork, and requirements force you to dictate that those assets have unique serialization on them. Risk mitigation, obviously our brand name is probably one of our most important assets. We don't want to be the one that shuts down a line, right? If our assets aren't showing up or they're rejected, we have to have the track and trace systems that can do some of that predictive analytics we talked about to make sure our brand is not at risk. And then data integration. 
more and more companies now are, are requiring that we have B2B connections from our ERP systems to their ERP systems in order to conduct business and also help with the AR, AP um, of order management. So the Internet of Things, right? Everybody likes to throw this buzzword out there and say, oh, this is going to transform my business. I can't wait. The thing I like to focus on there is it's always referred to, or referred to as future state. Well, this is kind of here now, okay? A lot of companies are doing this, and there are systems out there that have plug-and-play track and trace solutions. I'll just kind of give you a high-level example of, let's say, the product that you're tracking uh, has individual serialization. They're all tagged with RFID tags, right? That ties to an IoT device that might be on your container or your pallet or your handheld. Then that ties to an onboard vehicle within a trailer with a 3PL or your shipping truck. What if we could take all that information and use that predictive analytics to reroute our load and say, hey, um, this isn't going to arrive on time. Now I'm going to reroute this load so I can shift my production, right? That's where all these things are talking to each other and giving us that system and predictive analytics that we can rely upon. So over the last 13 years, I've really specialized in dealing with implementing and kind of managing asset management systems. Um, the three most common technologies that we see every day um, are represented above here on this slide. And the first one I'm going to talk to you about is barcode, right? Nothing exciting. Barcode's been around for 50 years, whether it's linear, 2D, QR. Um, a lot of the perception I get from barcoding is, eh, it's old technology, it's been around forever, why would I look at that? Well, I'll tell you what, it's been around and evident in every industry because it works, okay? It gives you that line of sight, uh, instant feedback, and it's pretty straightforward and simple. However, obviously with all the benefits of the low cost that you see there up on the slide, it does require a little bit more manual labor, right? You have to have that line of sight. You're going to have to interact with your shipment or with your load a little bit more often. Um, and then it requires some hardware maintenance and software maintenance for the infrastructure as well. Passive RFID. I, you may have heard the term active RFID, but what I'm talking right now is passive. RFID, again, nothing new. It's been around for 35, almost 40 years now, and it's been implemented. RFID is one of those things that eliminates some of that manual labor in order to have item level detailed data capture. Um, the great thing about RFID is that it doesn't require the line of sight, right? You can use a handheld reader depending on the distance that you want to read it, or you can drive through or pass through a portal to get those reads. It is a little bit higher cost. And as we've seen standardization for RFID in the industry start to align, that cost is drastically dropped. So yes, it is a little bit higher than a traditional barcoding asset management system. I will tell you that it's probably talking now in terms of pennies when you talk about the tags, and then when you talk about the devices or the readers, a few hundred dollars US. Um, one thing I will cost you on RFID is I've dealt with it for about eight years now, is it is not a magic bullet. It requires an extreme amount of discipline to be able to manage RFID from an exception management, right? The shipping and receiving of goods with RFID is a lot different than barcodes because we can't see it, right? You have to have that on the floor user feedback so the operator knows what he's capturing. And if he does capture the wrong thing, how can he interact with that load to fix the data exceptions, right? And then this last piece here, um, this is probably more in lines with the IoT, but it's the active technologies, right? We're talking about making assets smart. Usually it requires battery assistance, so whether you're talking about GPS, cellular, Wi-Fi, BLE, or Bluetooth low energy, right? You have devices that can record and log and transmit on their own without having to have that infrastructure, right? Um, I will caution you that you know, this is much more expensive. In the automotive industry, we've seen a lot of pilots for tracking of 
engines, exhausts, metal racks, right, IT components. That's where the business case is gonna make sense to do some of these pilots for the active tracking technologies. The focus really here should be on battery life, okay? There is no, again, chart that will tell you when everything is gonna last because it depends on the frequency of how often you're reporting and pulling the data or logging the data. And then also all the sensors, right? Am I tracking the humidity, the temperature, the shock, the accelerometer? All that stuff is gonna drastically impact battery life and it can range anywhere from a few months, maybe all the way up to five plus years now we're seeing with some of these devices. Cost, BLE, you can probably find a pretty smart BLE device that's only a few dollars nowadays, US. And then cellular GPS, you're probably looking more along the lines of 100 to 200 dollars per device. It's a cell phone, right? We're putting cell phones with data plans on our assets. So the slide says not so distant future. And there are a lot of markets that are actually doing this. And the one thing I want to focus as an example here is the whole customs piece. You see in the left-hand side there, today, truck goes through a border, right? They have to produce the manual paperwork. There's an inspection. There's some type of interaction that takes a lot of time. And then again, you're prone to manual errors. Now what we're seeing is countries and industries are starting to look at automated trade that allows, in the IoT example I gave you, where if my parts are tracked and it ties to the reusable assets, which ties to the truck, I can now tie that to the order and have the supplier and the customer instantly have an ARAP transaction that the government or your country has visibility on to prevent fraud, right? We're gonna stop black markets. Uh, we can expedite taxes and audits as a result, um, but that trade can happen instantly, electronically, and not have to rely on manual intervention and processes. National security too, as well. Um, you know, to have a date and time stamp of every single good that came in and out of your border. Um, and then, obviously, the exciting stuff when we're talking about using this information for the predictive analytics and performance optimizations on the floor. Last slide here. Um, this is probably the most relevant slide that I deal with every day on is, okay, I have all this information, now what? What are the next steps, right? How do I get started on implementing a track and trace system? There are a lot of third party providers out there that might try to sell you technology to implement, right? Whether it's a SaaS solution or you might within your own organization look at building this uh, in house. I will tell you that the five steps that I would tell you to focus on are here are assess what type of assets you're trying to track, right? Is it plastic? Is it metal? What type of environment are they in? But the tagging of the assets is probably the most important step in this process. Overview of the supply chain, right? Am I looking to put a system in a closed loop or shared supplier format? How are my assets going to move? Do I have to implement my technologies or my, in, uh, on my customers' or suppliers' networks? Calculating the ROI. We heard earlier, right, the importance of ROI. You need to pass a sniff test in this because it has to deliver the savings both hard and cost. Hard cost CFOs and people like that, they're just going to look at what's my loss and what's the save not having to lose these assets. But there's a lot of soft cost savings in some of that labor that we talked about. Stakeholder alignment, I think this is probably the most important factor. And what I'm talking about here is top down and bottom up for stakeholder alignment of why we're implementing a track and trace system. It's nice if an executive comes in and says, yes, I know the importance, this makes sense, let's implement it. But if the guy on the floor doesn't believe in it or see the value, compliance is gonna be an issue, right? You're gonna run into data management exception problems and eventually you're gonna have a bunch of noise going back and forth and not, not knowing what to do with that data. And then finally, change management, right? IT people hate when I say this, but the technology part, that's the easy part, okay? That works, that stuff works. We can get that to work. Change management within your organization, how well you guys are at adapting new systems and new processes, that's really what's gonna take your tracking system to the next level. 
So if we could just close on looking at the poll results here. Oh, good for you guys. <laughs> um, I'm glad that everybody sees that because as we know the cost is going down, right? We know the technology works. It is the change of management and implementation. So interesting to see. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Sorry about the technical no, no, difficulties. No, Hold on to that so if you have questions, you can do it. Thanks, Keith. Sorry about the technical sound from ours. Uh, it shows that some, some, tech, some IT issues go across. You might want this. Yeah. Unless you want to give it away. Um, and I, I'm guessing you used some predictive analytics because you already knew what the answer to that poll was going to be in advance. So, you know, shows the power, the power of data again. Uh, so thank you to Keith, but thanks really to all of our panelists for their presentations and insight. Um, I thought they were all really interesting and you were all did it in good time, which means we have some time for questions, um, uh, which I'm sure there, there should be some around these, these kinds of complex areas. So um, usual way, we have a couple of microphones going across the room. Um, the bad news is just because you don't ask a question doesn't mean the gala dinner starts any earlier. Uh, so, you know, I've got a couple myself if, if nobody kind of wants to get us started. Um, so I think I will start with the, a little bit what we, what, we, what we polled at the beginning and what some of you have been addressing in one way or another about sort of Mexico's readiness uh, and implementation of, of these digital uh, technologies and strategies and systems. So um, clearly they're applicable here. Uh, but in, in your company's experience, can you point to, um, can, can, would you agree with the assessment that Mexico is potentially falling behind? Uh, is, it, is it, you know, in a position to catch up? Uh, is it actually at the same standard? Maybe we can start with you, Joe, because Penske obviously has pretty integrated operations across North America. You, it'll turn on. So. Yeah, it's, good. it's on. So in, in order to respond to that, I mean, there is definitely you know, some infrastructure challenges that continue to improve in Mexico. But I, I look at it from an entirely different perspective. A little bit earlier, uh, I was down with, uh, you know, the students and uh, talking about the attraction of automotive and, and supply chain. And um, I personally have had a lot of experience with the talent that's in Mexico. It is amazing. And we all know within supply chain, you know, one of the biggest challenges that we're going to be faced with in, as an industry is around talent. And the enthusiasm and the quality of the students that are entering into the industry can only really help advance. So maybe that there are some challenges in, in regards to current state, but the future, I am extremely optimistic and uh, really excited about not only what's happening in, uh, in Mexico, uh, but also what can be. You know, I, you know, I think uh, as I look at the opportunity for adoption of digital capabilities, uh, to me, it's not about driving cost down, per se. It's really about creating a supply chain which is agile and responsive. Because there is an incre incredibly high and consistently increasing amount of volatility in the business. I mean, if I go back 15 years, you know, the option forecast in vehicles would be really consistent, right? Now, there's a lot more variability in that. So the customers are used to being able to change their mind and with all the experiences they're having with, you know, Royal Caribbean and Disney and everywhere else, it's percolating into the automotive industry. So um, I think what's most important is being agile and responsive, but also being productive and efficient at that point. Um, so that's where digital capabilities can really help. Uh, it's tying your supply chain together. So if there is a signal, it doesn't take four days to get to the other end of supply chain. It should be a matter of minutes, right? That's where IoT comes in, and that's where you know predictive analytics can help forecast what you think might happen. Like we heard some really good examples from Akim. So I think uh, embracing digital uh, is going to just help uh, augment the rich talent and the incredible amount of opportunity Mexico has. Uh, it's not an either or. To me, it's the power of and. And I think it's not one plus one equal to three. I think one plus one equal to 11. That's my point of view. I think you want to 
opinion, in my opinion, uh, there's still a lot of room for improvement in Mexico. Um, saying this uh, very humbly, though, because they are certainly lighthouse projects, uh, which which prove us wrong because technology is deployed in many many warehouses, for example. However, uh, I believe that in Mexico. We are also busy in, in, in managing the growth. You know, we are so busy in the hamster wheel and making sure that we are keeping up with the production schedules that there that is our core objective to keep up with the track. And and we have across all industries in this country uh, a constant manpower shortage. You know, which is always in throwing us back and and it doesn't really allow us to to truly go to continuous improvement into the Six Sigma projects. So therefore, I believe that uh, we could make better use of. of technological innovation in Mexico, but I'm not saying that things are bad, but there's always room for improvement, and I think we don't have to look so far uh, to see areas where we can make quick use of technology to improve performance. Uh, yeah, I mean, just from my standpoint with track and trace, we are seeing that it is a need now more in Mexico. Um, we have some of our customers and our OEMs coming to us saying, hey, we want to put track and trace solutions for our assets moving across Mexico. Um, we're finding out that the network is getting stronger, the awareness is getting better, um, and there's a lot of companies out there coming to us saying, give us some IoT devices because we have stuff going across the border and it's kind of going into this chasm of unknown and we want to know where it's going, right? So one of the things we didn't talk about in all the IoT discussions is, you know, privacy laws and things like that. What can you and what can you not track, right? Is it your asset, but is it in a 3PL truck within a customer's network, right? So some of those things Mexico is really starting to bring to the surface where we need to focus our attention on. Just to, to add to that and also pick up on you know, the, the topic shared, you know, the underlying theme around what I was talking about um, is really around the change management, right? And the enthusiasm in Mexico to move forward and excel within the supply chain. And that's where I get extremely excited. And, and you know, the, co the question really is, um, you know, around how can we stretch ourselves? Right? Um, I think a lot of the technologies that are out there, the current track and traces and, and things of that nature, a lot of that are you know, entrance fees in order to you know, provide a service. Um, but I look at it beyond that and how can we really capitalize on the technology that's in the marketplace and how can we get this collaboration going amongst shipper and third-party provider. Today, we're deploying a lot of assets. I think we're all investing in uh, incubators and the latest and greatest technology that's out there. But I think it's within you know, our own chain of custody, within our own span of control, and how can we really stretch ourselves and reach and take it one step further. So when I think about acceptance and the conversations I have here in Mexico, that's where I get extremely enthusiastic about what, what the supply chain of tomorrow can look like here, and that's why I'm so optimistic on, on that statement. Well, it's, it's certainly a very good point. I think you know, we, we, we heard earlier from BMW and Audi and the, the kind of processes that they're putting in place inspire to where there's connected supply chain visualization across. So this is something that will apply to Mexico. You know, maybe it, it takes a little longer to get there, but that will happen. Um, you know, when, when, when I was speaking with Jose earlier about, um, you know, what to feed back to, to the customs authorities, I would probably suggest one of the things would be openness to, to this sorts of technology as well. I mean, it, it's also, there are things within the sphere of control for, for logistics providers and OEMs, but uh, uh, other kind of authorities will have to go along with them as well. So whether, you know, those kind of areas at the border, those would be ripe, ripe opportunities as well. That would be just a point from my side. We have a few questions sort of flowing in from the app, which I'm happy to ask. But again, anyone who puts a hand up, I'm happy, you know, we'll always sort of, and we do have a hand right there uh, in the back. Just you say your name and company, please. Trans Development Group. And uh, I had a question, you know, I'm almost exclusively involved on the finished vehicle side. And it seems like that whole industry is still stuck in small data. Like, Planning for daily operations is usually based, on my observation, on a few key operational metrics that people share over the phone often. Um, and small deviations in those can cause huge fluctuations in volumes and inventories, 
sometimes causing people to have to uh, shuttle vehicles long distances, great extra cost. Um, another example is when, uh, when there are uh, multi-levels being given to a destination ramp, we often see uh, the crews using walkie-talkies and pads of paper to write down which rail cars are in which direction. Um, and it's just a very inefficient process. They just go and figure out how they want to do it that day. So first of all, am I, am I wrong about this? And second, um, you know, what can be done to introduce big data uh, and gain some of these efficiencies? So I'd be more than happy to comment on that. You know, Penske is, is, has a vested interest in the auto dealership side. We have over 300 dealerships globally, so we definitely have, a, have an interest in the, in the finished vehicle. Um, but I think about upstream and downstream, right? What are all of the data points that we can uh, collect on the upstream and how can that benefit downstream to the final mile delivery of the finished vehicle. There is no doubt um, in saying that there is room for opportunity and optimization and increased efficiencies. But again, that's why I keep going back to how can we stretch ourselves and how can we recognize what's happening on the inbound side and how can we collaborate and work on the outbound side and how can we get much more predictive in that finished vehicle when it's going to help the in, uh, when it's going to arrive at the dealership. You know, from a dealership perspective, I'm sure they're all concerned about inventory levels as well, having the vehicle there for that customer and generating that, you know, that perfect customer experience. That's what all the OEMs are after. And I think there is just an enormous amount of information on the front end that can really aid to that customer experience at the point of purchase. It's how do we get together and bring it all to fruition. I think that's one of the biggest challenges is just that change management and recognition behind what we can do. You know, I think um, um, I'll, I'll take a slightly different um, view. You know, we work with clients where when, they're, when they have a vehicle being produced in North America, it has a completely different visibility and a line of sight than a vehicle which is coming as an import, right? So it could be uh, a different model or it could be a different brand, right, um, under the same company. So for a dealer, it's really challenging that if I'm selling model A, I can tell you within plus minus half day or one day when you're actually gonna get the car, but if you wanna buy this other truck, well, I can't really tell you, it might be plus minus four weeks. And I can't tell you when you actually should come to the dealership um, and you, you can't plan around when to come and pick up your car. So you'll, act, you'll get the call from the dealer when the vehicle is in transit to the dealer saying, well, can you come pick it up next week? And your response is, well, I'm actually on my way to you know, New Zealand for a vacation, and I'm gonna come back in three weeks, and I'll pick it up in three weeks. So from a customer perspective, um, having you know, various levels of uh, data and in integrity of data and different measurements in production process makes it really hard for a dealer to create a uniform customer experience. So I think there is a, a fair amount of work to do, uh, both from a manufacturing perspective where you can give a better ETA to the dealer who can give a better ETA to the customer. Uh, I think there is a whole element of import, you know, custom clearance, docs, uh, and that's where maybe predictive analytics can come in to say there is a congestion at this port. You know, uh, what we are seeing currently is it's the, the clearance uh, duration is increasing timing is increasing, so we need to adjust the ETA to the customer. So I think from a, and then, um, you know, it's, it's not a surprise when a finished vehicle, you know, comes off the line, right? It's, we know what the production schedule is, right? We know it down to pretty much the minute. So how can we better integrate the dealer forecast with that production schedule so the dealer is actually getting the option mix that he wants, um, at the right time rather than having a large number of vehicles which are close but not exactly what the customers want. So I think there is an opportunity to optimize from a manufacturing perspective as well as uh, transparency and visibility in supply chain and how that can truly make it a joyful experience for people like you and I to go buy a car. Uh, thank you for the, for the comments. Uh, I mean, I appreciate that um, we're not 
it's not necessarily a panel of finished vehicle logistics um, operators up here or, 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 or decision makers as such, but I think looking across is interesting. From my perspective, at very many conferences, I can make a few observations from that point of view. One is on the production point that, that Sven made, is that although obviously we know just about exactly how many cars are being produced per day, which is interesting is how the production constraints lead to variation in exactly which model comes off the line and in, to what destination. I know Audi just did a big project in Europe, very proud to be able to kind of predict a day in advance which, which for the carriers to know exactly what car to put on that load. It doesn't sound that advanced, but it takes a lot to kind of know exactly which car, okay, this red one going to, going to Paris, you know, with this kind of engine or whatever. So that variation is, is, is really complex. I think the other gets to some of the culture and change points that, that Keith mentioned as well. I mean, we've had events speaking with a lot of finished vehicle directors, particularly in North America, who seem to have some fear around the visibility that they provide to the dealers as well. Because when they give them that visibility, the dealers call a lot and customers call and complain and say, what's going on and what's going on? And, and, and it's sort of, you know, it, it, I don't know maybe whether that's a good or a bad thing to improve. But the, so there's, there's a lot of dynamics that sort of go into that. Uh, but I appreciate uh, the point and uh, I think there's a lot of interesting aspects of technology coming in too, whether it's the telematics in the vehicle and how that can communicate as a connected device. Um, so, so thanks again for the question. Any others from the floor? Because otherwise, again, I'll, I, I think I might turn to the, to the app. There was a good question on whether well, so everyone in the panel has seen any real-world application of blockchain technology uh, in auto logistics, although perhaps we can broaden it to say in logistics as well, because this is obviously a big, big buzzword, and everybody's talking about blockchain. Maybe they just regret if they didn't buy Bitcoin by now or something like that. But, uh, but we hear a lot about blockchain and how it's going to transform the supply chain, transform logistics. Anybody want to point to examples of where we can actually talk to some use cases or some potential use cases um, in the near future? Yeah, I can talk about uh, one of the use cases that, that we worked on. And it comes in, uh, you know, in transportation. So uh, if you think of the whole you know, transportation chain, there are, the vehicle can be, you know, at the dock, you know, um, lo getting loaded, you know, on, you know, on the ship, getting, going through a channel, um, and then, you know, getting offloaded, et cetera. So there are different discrete, uh, I, I'll say, checkpoints, right? And based on where the vehicle is, the insurance requirements and the insurance costs can vary, right? So one of the places where we've deployed blockchain for, for our clients is, you know, uh, knowing exactly where the vehicle is and who is in control and ownership of the vehicle, and then having the right uh, insurance to cover the vehicle, right? So what happens is uh, you're not overinsured, you're not underinsured, so you don't have too much exposure, but you're not also wasting money. So that drove, you know, significant value for the client where, you know, we were able to help them uh, optimize their insurance based on where exactly uh, the containers were and the ship was. Because going through, you know, a canal, you, you may have to give the control over to someone else, um, you know, the, the local agency which is actually going to steer the ship through the canal. So, um, so there they, they were, they were pretty interesting elements. Um, the, the other thing, um, the other area, it's more around car sharing, but uh, I can, I'll, I'll briefly mention that is it's called Tesseract, uh, which is actually a name for a cube inside a cube. Uh, but we built uh, Tesseract, uh, which is a blockchain application for car sharing. Mm -hmm. um, so we've, we've piloted it in, in UK. Uh, so those are real life example of where blockchain is getting applied you know, in logistics and in automotive industry. Yeah. Yeah, so just to, to add on and, and add a little different perspective, um, I, I think blockchain is probably one of the more exciting technologies and definitely getting a, a lot of attention in, in the press. Um, and we recently, Penske, has, you know, joined a consortium to you know, further development of blockchain and how can that apply as well as gain knowledge. But um, when I try to apply it to our industry and our, and our business, the 3PL sector, is around adoption rate, right? So how fast will this technology be adopted throughout our industry? And then there's you know, two looming questions, and that's around who's gonna host it, 
and who's going to govern it. And I think those are essential components to really have that end-to-end -end control. It's kind of like Facebook. If you join Facebook and you're the, you have no friends, it doesn't provide a whole lot of value. So how can we get that adoption rate to accelerate and get more of the masses into you know, the blockchain environment? Yeah. And Joe, that's the beauty of blockchain is the more people you have on the network, right, the more digital copies are there. So it's harder to uh, hack, right? Because now instead of hacking you know, one entity, you have to hack seven different entities. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to happen. Right? So, or if you get to 20 entities, now there are 20 digital copies which are uneditable. So that's where the beauty of the blockchain is. The more participants you have in the blockchain, the more secure and more robust it becomes. And, and that's the power. So digital friends are good. We don't want to be alone in this world. Um, actually, that, that last point about hacking um, kind of it goes, leads to nicely to the, the other question that was on, on the app and, and around cybersecurity. And so with all this discussion around digitalization and connectivity and, and data kind of flow, I mean, what methods are 3PLs or manufacturers putting in place to sort of protect themselves from potential cybersecurity issues and, and, and threats as, as we're seeing? Or, or what can they do? So, um, you know, we're, you know, and everybody's familiar with, you know, the ransomware. We had, uh, you know, WannaCry and, and, and others where a lot of uh, companies actually got shut down um, because they're, they're, the, the actual you know, machines, PLCs uh, that were being run were run, being run off Windows XP or other platforms you know, which, which had security um, threats and, and weaknesses. So what we are seeing, uh, especially, especially in the last six months, is a lot more awareness of I, I actually have a lot of vulnerability in my network. Because I am adopting IoT, because I'm using smart sensors, because I'm collaborating with my customers and my suppliers more, I need to have a better assessment of where my vulnerabilities are and then have a plan to address it because addressing those vulnerabilities is, is, is certainly not inexpensive. But we are seeing from manufacturing perspective um, a much more of an active awareness and, and, and pursuit of uh, managing cyber threats. So but I'll, I'll let you guys. Uh... I mean, you know, data is the currency of tomorrow, correct, right? So I mean, we all have to do our part to ensure the data that we have is protected. We understand what the vulnerabilities are. There's a lot of things you can do inexpensively. We engage white hats that are constantly trying to hack into our system to better understand where those vulnerabilities are. Um, and I think as more data is entrusted over to us, the more responsibility we have to ensure that that data is protected. Hello. I think um, that's always the first question I get asked is, tell me about your company's security policies, right? We have an agreement that we need you to sign first before we'll have discussions of what you're gonna track, right? Um, I think it's very important that we know what type of data we have um, within our system or on these devices, right? But what's interesting about that is when we are tracking assets, we're getting visibility um, to other people's supply chain and that data is important to protect. And a lot of these agreements are focused on that of who actually owns the data, right? Um, the cloud, right? Everybody wants to use a cloud provider. There are certain regulations um, and certifications, I think SSA 16 or 18 or something like that, that you have to pass uh, in order to put your data in the cloud. So these audits are getting more and more emphasis, but I'm also seeing sometimes people wanting to roll back off the cloud and saying, hey, this is very sensitive data it has to reside on our servers in-house, which is interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Any, any last questions on the floor? You're all starting to dream of margaritas. I can, I can <laughs> smell it from you. <laughs> I think I saw the hail damage repair guys run out of here because apparently it's hailing like crazy outside and they Ooh. smell some opportunity. So, um, um, so just a little note that before you go to the gala dinner, you might want to bring an umbrella uh, on the way to the bus. Um, perhaps a, a, last, a last question from, from my side, uh, and I think it was Sven who talked about um, past failures or sort of, sort of you know, being able to, or maybe it was even Keith, 
I mean, getting to that change culture point, because I think it's, a, it's an interesting one, and it's not an easy one, I think, particularly in automotive logistics, where margins are really, really limited, and, and you know, the Silicon Valley model of, of 18 out of 20 companies failing, and one making, making all the profit out for the investors just doesn't seem so applicable in, 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 in the logistics space, per se. So how do you kind of allow your company the room to fail, to innovate, um, while still, you know, not shutting down production lines or, or putting, putting your business and customers at, at risk um, in such a kind of operational day-to-day -day sort of business? Just any, any reflections from the panel? Oh, I, I think it's, you know, an absolute requirement to test new products and technologies and capabilities, uh, test them in safe environments, and accept that it is okay to fail. It's very encouraging working with partners out there that have a similar mindset, that want to try different technologies and how it can apply to better their supply chain, their overall cost, their final experience to their end user. Um, so a lot of it is really stretching ourselves, um, recognizing the different technologies that are out there and, and it becomes harder and harder because five years ago, you know, there's probably maybe 100, 150 technologies in, in development for supply chain. There are thousands, literally thousands. That's why I go back to what is the challenge we're trying to solve? Because you can get caught up real easy in all of the wonderful things that are happening out there, but how does it really benefit the end user? I, I think there, uh, there are two things uh, you know, I'd say about, um, you know, really thinking about your unique, you know, business and situation, and what sort of, uh, I'll say, planned experiments are gonna create value, right? Because that's the ultimate goal is, how can I drive more value? Right? It can be through cost reduction, it can be through increased flexibility, responsiveness, whatever, whatever the parameter might be, but what is that design set of experiments uh, that are gonna create more value for my business, and, and, and why do I wanna do it? I think really that why is the, the critical question, right? Um, so I think having that framework uh, helps prioritize what do you want to do because there are so many experiments you can do. A lot of time we see companies just going after an idea and then next, then next, without really having a plan of why am I doing it, right? Um, so that's one thing that, that's, that's really important. The second is, you know, creating that, and I think Joe, you mentioned it, is that safe environment where you can do experiments and you can, you know, if you, it's okay to fail, right? Because none of us, you know, ever grew up, you know, thinking it's okay to fail. But now we are in an environment where we got to try. We got to try and, you know, we, we learn by trial and error. So what I'm seeing a lot of clients do is actually setting up a small little, you know, innovation, incubation group. And in fact, you know, we just finished a project where we applied machine learning to forecasting, demand forecasting for, for our automotive client. And for the two sets of products that we pilot, you know, did a proof of concept, it improved their forecast accuracy by 40%, right? Um, one product, it only improved it by 10%, right? So it's, it's okay that you're not getting best results everywhere. It's okay to get okay results somewhere, but guess what, it really works well here. So let's apply it to this. So uh, we, we're starting to see uh, application of deep learning, right? in how do I better, and this isn't for automotive, it's for, it's for consumer products, it's how do I apply um, synchronization to my demand and supply so I can optimize my inventory level, re reduce my working capital while keeping my fill rate you know, where I want them to be, otherwise I get hit by, the, hit by penalties. So we're seeing application of deep learning and others in a safe environment, and once it works, then actually selling it to you know, the leadership team but you've got to have a sponsor. Somebody needs from the top to say, uh, we have to do this, otherwise, you know, we're going to go extinct. Mm -hmm. Yes, I also mentioned in the course of the, in the, course of the presentation, uh, in our dual approach, the innovation on the shop floor is most likely not becoming a disruptor and putting business at risk, but where we have complex ideas we created a, bit, um, a governance model, which we are applying within our organization, but also together with our partners with whom we are developing this project together in order to clarify roles and responsibilities. And that has proven to work out very, very well. And uh, in our organization, we, despite 
having to be extremely productive and efficient, we, we do allow a climate to fail. And as I mentioned, uh, in, in various parts of the world, whether we go to California into boot camps or we do it in Europe, and we have now mentioned the joint venture startup where we're pumping significant amounts of, of, of money in, into speedboat fast prototyping uh, projects, uh, not all of them will succeed, obviously. But again, uh, we need to have the courage to be able to fail, but we are certainly not putting our existing business operation at risk by going through very rapid and uh, disruptive ideas uh, during live operations. So that's, that's, that's a clear point, you know, and I think that's common sense. Yeah. Yeah, lastly. lastly, I'll just touch on um, at Brambles and Chip. Um, Sven, your point on, on innovation, um, kind of being unhindered, right? We don't want to put the normal processes and checkpoints sometimes to say, hey, how's our ROI? Or are we checking in and this is tracking? I mean, you have to have some milestones, but innovation can come from all levels within an organization, right? From the person on the floor, from the executive or the manager. So you need to set up a program that allows some of that to um, fester and, and kind of fail or win on its own. Um, and then you can put a bigger project behind it. So um, I think setting up these small little innovation things that say, hey, don't worry about the financial aspect of it, right? Let's just focus on the solution and see if this is viable. That's a, it's a good point, and it's sort of a logistics R&D, so to say. I mean, if companies don't, don't take this space, then they won't move forward. And uh, Louis and I like to be the poster boys for failure after all, so you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important way of moving forward. Okay, well, um, I think that's probably a good point to, to on the point of failure and, and, and moving forward, it's a good point to kind of uh, draw a line under the, the, the discussion today and start getting ready for the gala dinner. Before we, we break, hold on, let's, let's say thanks to our panel again, great presentations and discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will have some coaches leaving here in the, in the next 10, 15 minutes or so, we have time to, uh, to drop your bag off if you want to or pick up an umbrella because uh, I think it might be raining a bit, but hopefully that's going to that's gonna stop. But the, the, the buses will be leaving from right outside the hotel, so you won't be exposed for, for too long on it. Um, I should also just say, just quickly before you go, a quick little plug. Since we're talking about digitalization, disruption in the industry, uh, a new project for, for our company is, is something called Automotive IT International, a magazine which is outside. You could pick up free copies. It's talking about a lot of these this issues, but across the industry, across the value chain, not just logistics including many parts. And we're launching a conference in Atlanta, which sits besides our supply chain conference, which actually, Sven, I know you spoke at last year. Um, we're going to join these events and, and share some of the, we'll have the CIOs from car makers sort of sitting next to the logistics, heads of logistics at car makers. We think it'll be an interesting mix. We think it's the right time to bring this together. This will be in May, end of May, May 21st, 23rd, I believe. Uh, we can give you all the more information on that. Pick up a copy of Automotive IT International. Uh, like I said, this is part of what we're doing now. I just wanted to plug it. Uh, thanks again. Look forward to the gala dinner with the Penske hosted gala dinner.